okay. John chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse 20, 22. It says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was much water there. And people came and were baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between John's disciples and a Jew over purifying. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, here he is, baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, No one can receive anything except what is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now full. And so what John is saying to his disciples who were jealous on behalf of John because more people were going to Jesus now than to John. And what John is saying to his disciples is it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me that more people are going to Christ. It would not bother the friend of a groom if he went home with his wife after the celebration. That wouldn't make any sense. The bridegroom gets to go home with his new wife. That's the way it's supposed to be. And Jesus gets to have the devotion of the people. John says that's the way it's supposed to be. And I'm happy about it. That was the purpose of John's ministry, wasn't it? To point people to Jesus Christ, to prepare them for Christ, and then to point them to Christ when He came on the scene. Verse 30, John says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And those are not the words of some radical follower of Jesus Christ. Those are just normal. John is just a normal follower of Jesus Christ. John is somebody who has made Jesus Christ his Lord. And so those are not the words of some radical. John is just being normal, that's all. If Jesus is truly our Lord and our Savior, then our goal will be to be more to more and more die to self and more and more submit to Christ. That's just normal for somebody who has made Christ Lord. We want Jesus to increase and we want to decrease ourselves. 31. John says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth. And of the earth he speaks. He who comes from heaven is above all. And here John gives the reason why Jesus must increase and he must decrease. He says Jesus is above all. Jesus is above all. Jesus is God. Jesus came from heaven. That is why he must increase and John must decrease. And that is why he must increase in our life and we must in, must decrease. And that's, you know, what because he is above all, because he is God, what he wants is more important than what we want. Verse 32. He bears, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. It is tough. When you know some, something is a fact, something's absolutely sure, you know it. And you tell people about it, well, they don't believe you. It is tough. When you know, deep down in your knower, you know that something is right, something is true because you have experienced it, or you have seen it with your own two eyes, and you tell people about it, nobody believes you. Jesus knows what that feels like. Look, Jesus knew everything. He knew 
100% for sure everything he said was true because he was in heaven before he came to earth. When it comes to spiritual things, he is the authority because he's, sent, he's seen it. He's been there. He, like I said last week, he has invented the rules. He knows what he's talking about. And yet very few, relatively speaking, believed him when he was here. Verse 33. He who receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. In other words, when you accept the words of Christ, not just the words that are probably written in red in, in your Bible, when you accept the words of Christ, those plus the words that He inspired His apostles to write, meaning the entire New Testament, when you accept the words of Christ, what you are doing is you are accepting the words of God as well. Verse 34. For He whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that He gives the Spirit. Jesus Christ did not have a measure of the Holy Spirit working in, in Him when He was here on earth. The Spirit was not given to Jesus from God the Father in measure. Jesus was not under the control of the Holy Spirit some of the time. Every word that Christ spoke was the Word of God. And everything that He did 100% of the time was being done by God. He did not have a measure of God's Spirit. Jesus was all God all the time. Verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And that goes along with what He was talking about in verse 34. The Father has given all things into Jesus' hands. Namely this, like the book of Colossians says, all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in the Lord Jesus Christ in bodily form. Jesus is not one-third of God. He is all God, 100% God. All the fullness was of God was in Christ. He had it all. As a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift. God gives all Christians at least one spiritual gift. And Christians walk in step with the Spirit sometimes. But it wasn't that way with Jesus. Jesus had every single spiritual gift that there was because He is God. And plus, not only that, He was always in step with the Holy Spirit. Verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God rests upon him boy did you notice that he who believes in the son has eternal life he who does not obey the son shall not see life but the wrath of God rests upon him you know what that tells me it tells me that belief and obedience go hand in hand Saving faith and obedience go hand in hand. The Bible says here that Jesus gives eternal life to all those who obey Him. I'm not talking about it's not talking about salvation by works. We know that that can't be right. But Jesus gives eternal life to all those who obey Him because the grace that gives the gift of salvation. That same grace that gives you the gift of salvation also gives the gift of a heart for God. And the same grace that gives you the gift of salvation also gives you the gift of a desire to obey God and the power to obey God too. Not, not talking about sinless perfection. But if someone is truly saved, they're going to have a heart for God. Deep down inside of them, they're going to have a desire to obey and please their Lord. And certainly the direction of their life ought to be toward obedience to God. And, and nobody is perfect because the sanctification process begins at the moment you're saved and it continues on until the day you die. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard 
that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Stop there. And so things were happening just as John the Baptist wanted them to happen. Just like he said they would. Jesus was increasing and he was decreasing. And you know those religious rulers, they didn't like John the Baptist any more than they liked Jesus. They didn't like John the Baptist because they couldn't control him. He just preached the pure word of God. Anyway, the religious leaders didn't like John the Baptist's popularity. All the people that were flocking out to him. They didn't like that. Now they notice Jesus' popularity too. And you can bet they don't like that either. Verse 2. It says, Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. And so, the Lord Jesus, he focused on doing what only he could do. And that's what specialized in preaching and teaching the pure word of God. So while he was busy giving out the pure word of God, he delegated the job of baptizing to his disciples. Look at verse 1 and then verse 3 because they flow together. It says, Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, verse 3, He, Jesus, left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He said, Man, that doesn't seem right. Why would Jesus take off? Was he intimidated? No. You know better than that, right? Christ was not intimidated by the religious leaders. He avoided confrontation because it wasn't the time for confrontation with these guys. He will have confrontation with these religious rulers, but when it is Christ's time, not when it is their time. Verse 4. Verse 3 says he left Judea. And just in case you're not familiar with the Holy Land and how it's laid out. There were, there were three general sections to the land of Israel back in those days. On the top, way up north, there was Galilee. And then in the middle, there was Samaria. And then on the southern part, where Jerusalem was, that was Judea. And you see in verse 3 that Jesus was baptizing with his disciples down in Judea, close to Jerusalem, in that southern portion. And he wanted to go up to he wanted to go up to Galilee. And verse four said he had to pass through Samaria. You would think that since Judea is on the bottom and Galilee's on the top and Samaria's in the middle, that that would be the normal route, right? For anybody who wanted to go from north to south, right through Samaria, but it was not. The Jews, the pure blooded Jews could not stand the Samaritans. And they would not. They would. They would go to great efforts to avoid even stepping on that middle section of the nation Israel. That it all started way back in the Old Testament, because there was a civil war in Israel, and it was divided between the north and the south. And the northern part of Israel included the area of Samaria. Well, during that divided kingdom the Assyrian Empire came in and conquered the northern part of Israel. And the Assyrians took that northern section of Israel, took the people into captivity for the most part. Didn't take all of them, but most of them into captivity. And then the Assyrians came in and populated that northern part of Israel. Well, the Assyrians that came in intermarried with the Jews who were left there. And so what was created was a half breed, half Sumerian, or half Assyrian and, and half Israelite. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the religion became a mixture of Judaism and Assyrian paganism. And that continued right on down to Jesus' day. So that's why the pure blooded Jews could not stand the Samaritans. And they would do everything they possibly could not to even step on their soil. In fact, you know what they would do? If somebody wanted to go, like say, from the south up north, they would go way to the east, cross the Jordan River, get outside the boundaries of the country, go all the way up until they hit the northern part, and then they'd cut across and go into Galilee just to avoid stepping on soil. That's how much they, they, they were disgusted by them. 
But Jesus did not pay attention to that kind of nonsense. There was somebody in Samaria that he needed to talk to. Somebody needed to get saved. So that's why it says he needed to go through Samaria. Verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Sychar, another name for Sychar is Shechem. You guys have been with us or watching on television on or Sunday morning through Genesis. You probably remember Shechem, the city of Shechem. Remember that's where Jacob and his twelve sons settled when they came back to the Holy Land from being with their uncle Laban. They settled down in the, close to the city of Shechem and that's where Jacob's two older sons, Simeon and Levi, went into the city of Shechem and slaughtered every male in that city because of what one guy did to their sister. That's the city of Shechem. That's where Jesus is right here. Verse 6. It says, Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jesus was tired because he had walked a long ways and he was tired because it was 12 noon and that was the time probably when, well that's the time when they ate, just like we do. But the thing that I like about this is just the fact that it says that Jesus was tired. Because that just reminds me that Jesus is not a distant deity. He's not a distant deity so far removed from us that he doesn't understand what you're going through. Man, he understands what you are going through. He understands your weaknesses your physical weaknesses because he'd been through them all. The Bible said, including, including physical weaknesses, he was tempted in every way like we were too. But he has experienced he has experienced hunger and thirst and fatigue, all that sort of thing. Jesus, Jesus was no ivory tower preacher who didn't know what life was like in the real world. And uh, the Lord experienced all the negative things that we experienced not, in, not detail for detail because the situations are different, but in principle he definitely did. Verse 7. So, you know, when you come to Christ, remember that. Remember that he can sympathize with you. But that's true. If, if you have gone through something that somebody else is struggling with, what? You really are sympathetic to that person, aren't you? Somebody who's never gone through that they can be arrogant about it and they can look down on you or something. You shouldn't be feeling that way or whatever. But man, if you've gone through it, you're sympathetic. You've been there. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of Savior we have. Seven. There came a woman, woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. But well, he didn't say it like that. He said, Give me a drink, I suppose. But here's a woman. She's just minding her own business. Doing the things that a normal woman would do fetching the water but while she's busy doing her everyday normal chores she doesn't realize this that she's about to have an encounter with Almighty God that's going to change her life forever this day started out like any other day she had no idea but she asked but Jesus asked her for a drink of water and verse 8 for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food I find that a little strange when I first read that Jesus had 12 disciples. He sent all 12 of them away to get food into the city. He wouldn't have to do that. A couple of them maybe, right? Maybe half of them. All 12 of them? He had a reason for doing that. He sent those 12 guys into the city because he wanted to have a private conversation with this woman. And, you know, Christ could have changed rocks into bread and saved his disciples a trip into town. He could have made it easy on them. But he didn't, because he wanted to have that conversation with this woman alone. And it leads me to say this. When, when Christ doesn't do things the easy way for us, he has a reason for it. You ever wonder why, I mean, you can think of just a, such an easy way to solve a problem or to get from point A to point B, but it just doesn't work out that way, and you wonder why God doesn't do it that way. It's such a simple thing that you would do, you would say, you know, if you were God... But when he, when he doesn't do things the easy way for us, he has a reason. He doesn't always tell us what that reason is. But faith believes that it's a good reason. And it trusts that it's a good one. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, 
How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. The Jews believed that the Samaritans were unclean, like I said, because of the half-breed thing. They would not even... A Jew would not even take a drink of water from a cup that had been handled by a Samaritan because they would be afraid that they would be defiled. That is not God's standard. That is a man-made standard. And Jesus, Jesus did not pay any attention to that. And, you know, the only standards that we should follow, that we should be concerned about following, are the standards that are set by God. And whether people liked it or not, that was the rule that Jesus lived by. He upset a lot of the religious rulers because he didn't follow their, their standards. But he lived by that standard, the ones that were laid out by God. Upset some people because of it, but that's what he did. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus said to this woman, if you only knew the gift of God. So many people do not know the gift of God that Jesus was offering to this woman right here. But he said, if you only knew the gift of God. Most people today in the world are too busy chasing the wind to know the gift that God has for them, or even to think about the gift that God has for them. They're too busy chasing after things in this world to investigate the gift of God that He has for them through Jesus Christ. We even care about it. But if a person only knew the gift of God, if, that, if the unsaved people of the world, if they only knew, if they only knew just how great the gift of God the gift that God had for them through Jesus Christ. The gift of eternal life. If they only knew how great that gift of eternal life was, you know what they would do? They would sell everything that they had in order to get it. If they only knew how good it was, they'd sell everything they'd have to get it because it's worth that much. It's that good. Verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Well, Jesus is offering her water for her soul. But she's still thinking about water for her body. Her mind is so focused on that physical water, is so focused on the physical, that the spiritual thing that Jesus was talking to her about went right over her head. That is what a carnal focus will do. A carnal focus scrambles the signal that's coming from God and makes it impossible for a person to pick up what God wants to say to them. And when I say carnal focus, I'm not, I don't necessarily mean a sinful. I'm not, I'm not even talking about thinking about something that is sinful. Just a carnal focus, focusing too much on the things of the world short circuits the signal from God and he just can't get through. The problem is never with the transmitter in that case. It's always with the receiver. That's why prayer before Bible study makes such a huge difference. Prayer before Bible study, prayer before reading the Word of God or listening to some kind of good music, Christian music, anything like that that will get your mind focused in on, some, on the spiritual and off the world, man, when you do that, it just opens up the floodgates. And then you open up the Word of God or you come to Bible study or Sunday morning, whatever it is, and God will just pour truth into your soul. But if a person comes in with a carnal focus, a physical focus, forget it. It's just going to block everything out. And that's what's happening with this woman. She is so tuned into that water that she has to get that she is missing what Jesus has to say. She thinks he's talking about physical water. Verse 12, she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? It sounds like she's getting a little feisty with Christ here. Doesn't she? 
know, he said he could he could deliver better water than what Jacob did out of this well. And her response seems to be, well, Jacob's water out of this well was good enough for my ancestors and for their ancestors, and it's been good enough for me. She's just a little shocked that he would claim to be able to give better water. Verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, Jesus is saying the water from this well will satisfy you for a little while. But only for a little while. That's why she had to come back there every day. The water from this well will satisfy you for a little while. But Jesus says, I will give you water that will satisfy you forever. And if you are a Christian walking with the Lord, you can understand what I'm talking about here. And what Jesus is talking about. Because if you're saved, and if you're walking with the Lord, and there are no unconfessed sins in your life, you will not feel like something is missing. If a person is saved and walking with the Lord like they ought to be, they won't feel like they need something different. They won't feel like that, that, they, that there's something lacking in their life because they will know that they have the best. Christ satisfies. No matter how long you've been walking with Him, He satisfies. He never gets old. just gets better. Always satisfies. That's the living water that Jesus is talking about here. Satisfies forever. Bring contentment. But notice verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. <laughs> Slow to learn. God is a patient teacher. Good thing he is with all of us. But she's still thinking physical. So she says, Okay, give me some of that give me some of that super water, Lord, so you know, that satisfies for a long time. That way I won't have to come back to this well every single day and, and get water. It's some kind of super water that you know, you drink it and you, and you stay quenched for maybe a week or so or two weeks. Maybe I don't have to come back to this well except once a month. Jesus has to do something to change this woman's focus onto the spiritual. So he does in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. Well, Jesus forces her to shift gears right here by confronting her over what he knows is a sin in her life. She needs to start thinking about spiritual things and, and quit thinking about material things. You know, there comes, there comes a point when small talk about things that do not matter for eternity needs to stop. And people need to start thinking about and talking about their immortal soul and dealing with those issues that really make a difference. And Jesus is going to force this woman to do that right here. He really loved her. Verse 17, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus told her to go call her husband. She says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you said truly. Jesus knew everything about this woman. He knew her sins. She had been married five times, and now she's guilty of the sin of fornication as well. Jesus is really hitting a sore spot with this woman. He's hitting a spiritual nerve because he confronted her about the sin that she is guilty of. Word of God has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Boy, it just has a way of hitting those nerves. If we're doing something wrong, you can really feel it. Verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yeah, well, he knows exactly what's going on in her life in the sins that she is guilty of. God's speaking to her through Christ. And it's making her feel very uncomfortable. In fact, it's making her feel so uncomfortable that she's going to change the subject. Well, that's the wrong thing to do. That's the wrong direction to go. When spiritual issues, when the Word of God starts making a person feel uncomfortable because of doing something wrong, the answer is not change the subject. The answer is not, you know, turn off the program, the Christian program, or close the Bible. It's not the answer. You've got to deal with it. Sooner or later, you've got to deal with it. Verse 20. She says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Well, the Jews said 
that the central place of worship, and it was a central place of worship throughout the Old Testament, was the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. If you want to worship God, you have to go to Jerusalem and the Holy Temple. The Samaritans worshipped on some mountain in their area of the country. And what she says is true. You know, she brought up a fact. The thing is, it didn't have anything in the world to do with what Christ was talking about. You see what she did? Jesus hit a nerve with this woman instead of dealing with her need of personal re repentance she changes the subject. She wants to talk religion. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's much easier for an impenitent sinner to talk religion, to talk religious issues, than it is for them to talk about the Word of God. And that's what she's doing. She's shifting the subject again. Verse 21, he responds. He says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The Samaritans worship... Well, let me read verse 21 again. It says, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. As I said, the Jewish religion, in the whole Old Testament, Judaism in the Old Testament, they had a central place of worship, which was the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus says the time is coming when those who worship God will not be having to go to a special place of worship. And that time is here. And it's been here since the day of Pentecost when the church age began. We don't have to make pilgrimages to any place to worship God. You can worship God right where you are. And He will receive it too. As long as there aren't any unconfessed sins in your life. Now verse 22. Let's stop with this. You worship what you do not know, Jesus told her. We worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. Like I said earlier, the Samaritans worship the confusing mix of the God of Abraham and their pagan gods. And Jesus said salvation did not come through your religion. Not all religions are equal, you know. Salvation is of the Jews. Um, the Jews worship the one true God in the Old Testament. That's why salvation was of the Jews in the Old Testament. They had the true religion. They had the true word of God. Salvation came to the Jews. If somebody from any country wanted to be saved, they had to convert to Judaism in order to receive eternal life. Salvation was of the Jews in the Old Testament, and it didn't change with the New Testament either. The Jews were a pipeline of salvation to the whole world in the Old Testament, and today the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the King of the